Okay, so this is the April edition of the Workforce Student Workforce Development Interest Group call. Um, if we can switch to the next slide, please, Albert. So um, just wanted to welcome everybody to this call. Uh, the student and staff workforce development were started uh, sometime last year. Uh, and we had a session at uh, the Nexus day uh, that preceded the 2022 PERC get my ears straight here. And out of that, we started these uh, calls uh, every other month, uh, alternating months between student and staff uh, workforce development. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved, please reach out to either Betsy or myself. Uh, we're looking for additional people and we'll talk, that, talk about that more towards the end of the presentation. Uh, the first thing I just wanted to mention, um, if, Albert, if you can please change the slide, is um, we do have, as an outcome of the Nexus Day uh, workshop, uh, we did put together a student survey, and we uh, that was distributed or mailed out to a number of mailing lists about three weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. I've attached the link here. So if you have a student program and uh, you have a few minutes, we would appreciate you taking the time to complete the survey. It's a two-part survey. The first part should only take you a five, 10 minutes of some basic questions about your student program. And then after that, if you uh, have additional time and are willing, you can uh, do the long version of the, uh, of the survey, which will ask you a few more in-depth questions narrative questions about your student program. Uh, so far we have 14 results. So thank you if uh, you're one of the institutions or people who have completed the survey. And hopefully uh, the, by the time we have the next call, we'll talk about the results and ways to share these results and provide information for uh, departments or, or uh, institutions that are looking to start a student programs so that you uh, can learn, learn from those uh, institutions that have a student program. Okay, and with that, I wanna go ahead and introduce Elpir from, Elpir from um, Northwestern uh, University. Uh, and I see Scott is yeah. also here and I will give a thanks to Scott who basically did the first draft of the student survey for us. So thank you, Scott. Um, anyway, they're going to give a presentation on the student program that exists at Northwestern. So Albert, please. Sure. Thanks, Anita, and thanks everyone for being here today. So yes, Scott is out as well with me today. So uh, basically, um, we are talking. We are going to talk about our um, the history, basically the summary of our program, and then we'll talk about some more. Um, details of our uh, program works, budgets, um, student responsibilities, and we will talk about, since we, we will be talking about onboarding, we have a section on that too. And then uh, we'll talk about some lessons learned at the end. So here's basically, we will start with describing our program, and then we'll talk about how we plan our budget. We will discuss student responsibilities, then we go into more in-depth like student procedures, the program procedures, including hiring, onboarding, and managing. And then uh, briefly mention how we communicated impact so far, and then we end with lessons learned. So um, here is our brief summary. So a similar slide was presented in our PERC um, panel that Betsy was leading in the past, so in 2022. So, in 2016, when we started this, we got uh, four students. So in that time, I was leading the effort. So currently, Scott is um, leading most of the, or taking care of most of the program um, needs and leading the student team. So when we started, we had four students in 2016. And in 2023, now we have 21 students 
on three different tracks, including data science support track, computing support track, and infrastructure support track. So this evolved actually as our team evolved. So when we first started, students were helping us in some miscellaneous tasks, either with faculty projects or um, the internal projects, and we didn't have very clear lines of uh, support functions. Now we have delineated the support requirement or support um, tasks between within our team. We actually use the same model to delineate our student support as well. And between 2016 and 2023, we had 56 students, and they are mostly like halfway divided by between the data science support and computing support. The infrastructure team have recently been started hiring students. So that's a new track um, that we are offering within the research computing at Northwestern. So this is the main distribution. So we have um, 12 students in the data science support team. Two of them are undergraduates and 10 of them are grad students. In the computing support team that Scotty is leading currently, we have uh, seven students that's uh, four of them are grad students, two of them are undergrad, and there's one year up intern, which I will come to that uh, later. And then the infrastructure team has one uh, grad student and one undergrad. So that's the total distribution in our team. And you will see why actually the data team has uh, many more students um, a, bit, a few slides later. So this is our website. Again, this is a, uh, very recent website and still developing. So you see the cyber infrastructure track is still coming soon, uh, but you can actually see our documents in the following links for data science student consulting program and the computing support uh, student consultant program. So uh, these pages practically discusses the job responsibilities, what students they do, how actually this role contributes to their careers. And then we have great anecdotes from our students as well as we post our advertisements or job listings here as well for different tracks. So how did we get here? Uh, basically, we, we actually grew, grew incrementally and we did improvements along the way from 2016 to 2023. So basically we can separate out the, the timelines or like the different stages of our growth. So the first one is we can call from zero to one. This is the stage we actually uh, ask leadership if we can do it. So it requires volunteering, like we want to have a student body. So it's not programmatic or anything yet. It's just we want to have student support because we cannot actually catch up with everything. So this is where we um, communicate with the leadership. We just try to secure something like $5,000 to support the student for a year, so for their hours, and uh, got feedback practically of how we could actually organize this from, from leadership again. So it's just get it off the ground, just make sure that you, that I communicated the requirements, the needs um, regularly with the leadership until I got the okay and the budget from this, uh, from the IT, so we can actually hire a student. Uh, from one to three, actually, this is the time that we that I started thinking about the best practices, basically, because I'm going to repeat the same process again and again. So, what are the things that I need to be doing in hiring? What I need to be doing on boarding each student, and what are the better uh, managing practices? This is where I actually started learning a bit more about managing. I was, just, I was in a senior law role at that time, and then I didn't have managing experience. So I started like attending training, learning about uh, how I can manage people and students in that manner and how it is different between, uh, how, it, how that is different from uh, regular staff members to uh, managing students. And then also definitely the diversity. So you want to represent the, your communities uh, community's diversity in your student team too. This could be um, backgrounds, departments, gender identity, and so on. So we need to be thinking about those where we go from one to three. After that, actually, 
it's stage comms that um, you cannot keep track of, like as a single person. After four, five, six, one person cannot manage, ideally, all the students, keep track of their progress, uh, their projects. So this is where we actually approach this more programmatically. Do we have a handbook for hiring? Do we have an onboarding handbook with all the training, documentation, links required? And then can we have actually peer mentoring, like senior students teaching or training uh, the new students? This is still um, an ongoing process. We, I cannot say we established this very well uh, because there are some challenges which Scotty may actually talk about them a little bit more in the future slides, but uh, it's still work in progress. And then the other thing is that uh, student, is there a student career act that we need to build? Senior and lead roles, the compensation, the differences, and so on. These are, again, still, although we are approaching this in a programmatic way, these are things we are still working on in our program. So when it comes to planning budgets, currently we have uh, 17 of those 21 positions are funded from the operational budget of the Northwestern IT. So uh, data and computing and the cyber infrastructure teams estimate their budgets or funding or the required money differently. So for the data team, they look at their previous year's number of consults, training, faculty projects per year, and then decide on however many hours they will need and budget accordingly. Uh, computing and CI funding, since we actually depend on or we do operational support more frequently, or we th there's a significant part of our job, we estimate the budget based on the current number of students and, uh, and an ex expected growth in the student body. So we look at the number of students that we have rather than the hours we need. Uh, we also have uh, graduate school assistantships, so graduate assistantships, three students. So we justify this to graduate students as these students are working 20 hours per week on faculty research project. So especially the data team uh, does this long-term engagement um, with, with faculty researchers on their projects. So graduate school granted us three positions where the um, tuition is waived. So this is a very popular program or popular position uh, between the grad students. And then finally, we have a year internship. So this is a program that, um, uh, that Northwestern IT collaborates with a year up program where uh, we have individuals um, that may not have the traditional education or the background that, that you may expect uh, somebody in this team. So it tries to uh, actually fill the gap or the, close the opportunity gap between um, these type of roles and people who don't have the, um, the education or the traditional education for these type of roles. So how do the hours work? Uh, data science team generally estimates or needs about 30 hours per week and students volunteer for uh, these 30 hours either as uh, consults or trainings that are required. And then due to that, actually, they retain a large number of students. So they don't commit to saying, okay, we will give you five hours every week or 10 hours every week. So they hire 10, 15 students every year. And then whoever volunteers to do the work during that time, they could take that time and then um, work on it. Uh, our team, the computing and infrastructure teams, uh, work differently. So we look for fixed shifts during workdays because we need to resolve tickets. We need to do uh, account management. So those operational tasks are happening daily. So we look for 10 hour shifts or at most max up to um, 10 hour work shifts during a week from, from a student. Graduate assistantships, as I mentioned, they they are working 20 hours per week uh, entirely on uh, research projects with the faculty. And then the year up internship is a six month commitment from the intern for full day. So I will leave the uh, stage to Scotty for the remainder of the slides. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks, Albert. Yeah, so um, 
uh, I'm going to touch on student responsibilities uh, and for two main uh, things to focus on here. So the first is those data science students. So um, those the consults that they do are related to specific programming problems, R, MATLAB, Python, Mathematica, Stata, et cetera. Um, and because that's, their, that's the type of responsibility that they have, that really impacts um, what the data team is looking for when hiring. So this also impacts wanting to retain some of these senior graduate students who maybe only work a couple hours, but they have a, they're proficient in some linguistic programs that nobody else, you know, can help and provide consultations with. Whereas on the computing support side and the infrastructure side, um, you know, we are looking for uh, students who are going to be able to provide more general support to our, you know, high performance, uh, our, our computing uh, community. And uh, so that involves uh, things like developing documentation, um, developing content for workshops, maybe YouTube how-to videos, as well as supporting staff projects longer term. Um, and in the notes section of this slide, um, Elper and I put a few examples of some project work that students have helped with before, um, testing and deploying SPAC as a way to install software on Quest is a project that a student has helped with, um, doing sort of a community study of scratch spaces at other universities before we went ahead and rolled out our own scratch space at Quest. That was work that a student helped um, helped the uh, staff with. So that's kind of more of the skills, um, communication skills, um, uh, writing skills that we're interested in over and above specific programming skills. Um, you wanna go to the next slide, Elper? So one of the first procedures that we worked on um, trying to iron out uh, was the hiring process. So as Alper mentioned, when you go from just one or two students to four or more, um, it's very important that the hiring process does not drag out for months, uh, which is something that can happen since you are sort of um, personally responsible for seeing that hiring happening. There's, you know, HR isn't getting in there and asking for things. So we went ahead between Elper and I, we wrote a, a Word document that describes in detail uh, things like uh, who are we going to tell about these opportunities so that they can uh, distribute the job posting to the sort of broader community um, to help you know, with that diversity. Because if we only email our own Quest announced listserv, we are you know, restricting sort of the visibility of our job postings. Um, we also keep track of our job description uh, so that we can easily post when it comes time to hire. Um, and we also um, keep track of, and this is one of the things that took the longest amount of time, was a consistent and sort of fair interview process for all of the students. So that involved applying a rubric to screen applications that we got that involved applying a rubric to analyze uh, the one-on-one -on -one interviews that we did, as well as uh, try and standardize the questions that we asked all the students. So many of the things that um, people are trying to implement in staff hiring, we try to bring to the student hiring as well. Um, next slide. Next slide. So once we ironed out the hiring um, procedures to help us um, make that happen in a more um, appropriate time frame, so we could start the job posting, get someone hired in a fairly quick turnaround, the next thing we wanted to do was work on ramping them up to being able to provide that daily uh, community support, um, both um, through tickets and through account management, but also be able to work on longer term projects like developing and giving their own workshops or developing and recording their own how-to videos. And so the first thing that was important uh, for us to standardize uh, and, and was 
um, basically have a onboarding meeting with them where we made sure that they had access to all of the systems and tools that they needed to have access to, whether that be you know getting added to the right Teams channels, getting added to the ticketing system, getting added added to the account management system, and all of these things, and just make sure um, that that was all taken care of. Uh, because there were some times in the past where it took a long time to realize that somebody couldn't help with something because they couldn't access or you know do a certain um, task. So just to make sure that we, nothing was neglected um, there on that first day one meeting. And then after that, um, and this is a question we always get in our interviews as well from the students was sort of like, what does our onboard, the students are very interested and are aware that they don't always have the skills needed to do what the job is asking of them necessarily. And so they, they do wanna, add, they even ask us during the interviews um what are our processes you know are we expected to just start helping with tickets the first day we start that you know kind of scares them that that idea you know and we explain to them no that there's about a one to two month um uh, ramp up and we have a, a document put together that serves two purposes one um it teaches it provides a on ramp for them to learn what they need to learn in order to do the job, but also provides them with a reference later for when they are solving issues that the community are facing. It makes them makes them more equipped to answer tickets and do that daily support if they have a reference for all of the links and materials that they themselves went through. Um, all right, next slide. So managing, um, so managing the students uh, is, I think Elper kind of touched on this, is still something that we are actively working on improving. Um, so we have a weekly group meeting and we have weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings with the students. Um, however, they only work up to 10 hours a week as Elper noted for the computing team. Um, and so that does make scheduling those kind of things tricky, as well as the fact that students um, week to week schedule may fluctuate um, a decent amount as well. Um, and so the best practice there is as you have more staff members, you can share that mentoring and most and equally as importantly, that project guidance, um, because those one on one meetings are really important for like, you know, I I'm having a student right now uh, do a video explaining the difference between Mamba and, and Conda uh, for software installs and why you should use Mamba. Um, but they need those one-on-one -on -one meetings to check in on the slides, check in on the script. They need to have that opportunity to ask you questions and give feedback on their project or their projects can sort of uh, falter or sort of stagnate if, if you're not able to provide that. Um, the other thing, as, um, as noted at the bottom, is um, the student peer men mentoring and the regular performance reviews are sort of aspirational things that we haven't been able to implement. And the reason for that largely in the past was when we only had two or three students um, and like one was a master's student, master's students are gone in a year. You know that going in if you hire a master's student. Maybe you hire an undergraduate, but you hired a senior undergraduate. They're also gone in a year. Um, graduate students, there's a little bit more opportunity there with the with the PhD students, I should say, uh, master's students or graduate students as well. But with the PhD students, there's more opportunity. But by the time they are at the point where they could peer mentor, um, it is thesis time um in many cases um and that does reduce their availability quite a lot um so these are some you know just the length of time of a student at a university are some factors that make student peer mentoring um difficult even if it is quite useful um next slide all right so we uh, only got a few more slides here um and then we'll open it up for questions so this is something Elper really took 
the reins on early on with the student program. As Elper mentioned, he uh, kickstarted it back in 2016. Um, eventually, the impact becomes easy to maybe self-fulfilling almost. So for instance, the data team. The data team can only do the 300 consultations a year that they're able to do because they hire students. So it's, you know, now it's self-evident. Like if the university wants to provide a service of 300 some data consults a year, they need to provide the budget for students. There's, it's, you know, one fulfills the other. But early on, that's not self-evident. And so it's very important to have anecdotes or metrics such as, you know, how many extra one-on-one -on -one consultations were you able to meet, et cetera, to really highlight uh, the importance of what the students can provide to the to the team. Um, Elber, is there anything else you wanted to touch on on this on this slide since you did a lot of this work? Uh, yeah, I mean, on? just just those bullet points. I was regularly actually do shout outs to student tickets that they resolved, like the the language that they used, like how successful was that uh, on like chat channels, Teams, Slack. Uh, we were pushing for blog posts from students just to show their impact or they're highlighting their work in newsletters, articles, and then providing just separate annual or semi-annual reports on their metrics. But as Skyda mentioned, as the years gone by, these are all rolled into our general service um, reports. So we, at this point, we really don't need to highlight this separately. But back then, we were doing this just to actually get more support or buy-in on the student program. Awesome. Thanks, Albert. Oh, we got a question. Uh, okay. Uh, awesome. Oh, we'll address them after the presentation. Great. But thank you for all those questions. Um, so this slide, I'm going to let it speak for itself. Uh, these are some uh, anecdotes uh, from the students themselves talking about why the program was rewarding to them. Um, so I'm going to let people read that um, and let the students speak for themselves there. And uh, we'll go ahead and move um, to lessons learned, um, which is our final slide um, or set of slides. Elper, if you want to move to the next one. Awesome. So I think one of the most important things to understand is that um, the students um, all have kind of unique things, uh, unique skills and things that drive them and assigning work accordingly will prove much more effective. So for instance, um, I had, I, we still have an undergraduate who's done an amazing job writing like a text editor, uh, how-to video, wrote a video about uh, learning command line for the first time, you know, bash for the first time. It's just super good at generating content, especially content aimed at very new people to HPC. Um, but it was really intimidated by tickets. D didn't didn't really. It was too much. You know, tickets were too much. So instead of just being like, well, you have to spend three hours on the ticket yada 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 and been very prescriptive about what their role is i just basically shifted their focus to mostly you know 90 to percent to 100 percent like content generation since it was just a much more effective like per hour use of this individual student's time um and the other thing um that um the second bullet point just you know, I'm not going to just read it off the slides. I'll give an anecdote here. You know, we were at our weekly group meetings. We were giving like a presentation to them on containers, a presentation to them on virtual environments, a presentation on MPI, because we thought, oh, well, Elper and I will share our technical knowledge in an attempt to, and then we asked them, you know, they were like, oh, can you like show us your resumes? And can you talk about your life? Like, why? How did you end up here? <laughs> As you know, they wanted uh, more than just technical this, technical skill that. 
they they wanted you know something more well-rounded than that um and we have been doing that recently i went through my resume i explained my own journey here etc and they've really appreciated and been receptive to the the that kind of engagement not just you know what's a container and why is singularity great or whatever um and then the other thing is be flexible you know just be be ready to be flexible they go on vacations you know there's spring break there's finals there's theses you know just be prepared to be flexible um and no matter how many handbooks you write yourself that will take care of the administrative burden for you. You, um, this last cycle, we got 44 applicants for two student computing consultant positions, which is great. But that's also 44 applications that in this case, one person <laughs> had to read <laughs> and uh, analyze, right? So just, you know, be honest with oneself and, and about some of those some of those realities. Now, if there was more than just Elper and I, would we share that burden as we talked about earlier in these slides? Absolutely, but you know, staffing fluctuates. It's just how it is, so just be prepared. Um, let's see. Um, the other bullet points I think speak for themselves, sharing student respons responsibility, try out different support models, like the da data science people do it very differently than we do in terms of how the student work hours work. Um, you want to go to that final slide? Yes. Um, I think this is important. Um, it's important in the staff roles. It's important in the student roles. You don't want to just get computer scientists applying for your position. Initially, undergrads, they were all computer scientists. Just, I don't know, apparently, apparently the word, because the word computing was in there, only undergraduates who were computer science <laughs> majors felt comfortable applying. Um, so it's something we've worked on improving a little bit by reaching out to different um, like student groups and stuff. And that's helped kind of expand out of, um, the graduate students tend to get a nice diverse pool of candidates naturally, more naturally, um, but undergraduates, it can be difficult. So I think we'll open up for questions, um, of which I think there were a good many in chat. Yes, yeah, Scott, when you go through the questions, do you mind, uh, I, I cut and paste them into our call doc as well so we can get the feedback, but if you wouldn't mind reading them aloud just so people, if they can see them or not see them, they know the question that you're answering. Absolutely. Um, so we'll start with question one. When you hire the graduate students, do you already have requests for projects that they will work on what if there are too few projects or too many projects? What if the student graduates before the project finishes or the project finishes before the student is done with the program? That is a great question. Um, so the data science team, um, you know, I'll, I'll go from the two ends. So I'll, I'll start with us, I guess, first. So the computing team, we do have that problem. And that is part of that sharing of that um, project guidance. So Elper and I, at this point, are the two only like um, um, fountains of I idea generation. So Elper and I have to like come up with enough projects just between the two of us so that they, you know, so that students have stuff to work on. Because the importance of project work is critical because as we all know, tickets, consults, things like that, you know, really fluctuate throughout the week, maybe during a student's three hour shift. You don't want them just sitting there doing nothing. And they really will latch on to project work. Like they'll really throw themselves at it if you give them something. Um, so the, the good news about too few projects is like right now we don't have a lot of staff projects, but there's always some new workshop or training that exists out there. So for instance, we had a student um, Nextflow, which is like a genomics workflow pipeline uh, that I had never heard of until people in the genomics community started using Nextflow. Uh, we just told the graduate student, hey, like you wanna throw yourself at this, learn it well enough to give a workshop. Uh, it's gonna be a very community specific workshop. It, you know, just, it's not gonna be some sort of general generic HPC topic like we we tend to do. 
Um, and he said, sure. And had great attendance. He did a great job and had great attendance. So the good news is as long as you like, if you can just keep finding like, oh, this workshop would be nice to do, they'll latch on to that. Yeah. You want to add I anything think there's, to that? Yeah, there's almost no end to content creation. So right. <laughs> if you don't have really projects, internal team projects, definitely you can always do with more content creation, either videos, documentation, trainings, workshops. So basically we don't really have the problem of too few because we can always generate those ideas for adding more content to what we have currently. Oh, you're muted, Scotty. Yeah, exactly. As, and it, but on the converse side, that does mean that like, um, uh, that that does add burden to you because as they just, I should say one caveat to that is as they become great content generators, somebody has to review that content and that person is you. And let me tell you how many video recordings there are in the pipeline yeah. that I have to review. And they're great, and like, it's great, but still, I just should point that out. Um, how do you yeah, check the hours students enter? Is it just a trust system or do you have some other means to use? Um, Elper and I yep. use the trust system. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, it's, it's in between, I would say. We have a kind of a, um, our tracker kind of thing, but very simple, right? We just want them to write how many tickets that they worked on, how many projects that they worked on, on their shift, but we don't need names or we don't need more data from that. And then on our one-on-ones, uh, we can understand what they're working on because there will be questions on the tickets, there will be questions on the projects that they've been working on. But other than that, we don't do deep dives into what they've been working on, so tracking, it's kind of like both sides, but very simplified uh, our tracking, basically. Yeah, I think, I think Albert, you, you touched on the key bit. You, by doing those one-on-one -on -one meetings weekly, you kind of get a good sense of whether or not work has, you know, progress. whether or not work has, progress has been made in, in um, that is commensurate with how many hours are being reported, but, you know without having to do like way too much work. So for the data science students, are you able to find students strong enough that can consult with faculty and researchers? Um, Albert, let you take this yeah, one. Yeah, I would, I would say definitely. Yeah, I would say definitely yes. Especially um, like programs like neurobiology, like genomics, and people that have strong uh, data experience when they are like the third or fourth year. So they can actually hit the ground running. So we definitely find those senior students uh, from our community to, to be able to consult, who can consult the other researchers and faculty. But there's always the, like a um, oversight from the data team to, to, to look at the level of consult that they need to provide. So they will decide who can provide those. Yeah, and that's a good that's a good point. So in terms of those like hunt like when it's a faculty project and a student is being associated with a faculty project, that is where it's you know it needs to go beyond uh, there is some you know real involvement from the data staff team in those faculty projects as well. It's not just sort of let the graduate student go completely. Uh, when it comes to those long-term faculty project engagement, engagements. Uh, would you share your job description and hiring criteria tests for the students? Uh, it's so a great Betsy, question. Do you yeah. do, are you planning to actually through this effort collect that type of information? We can yeah. actually provide yeah, so, that, yeah. Yeah, so rather than having this as student onboarding, I was, we should be breaking this down into hiring and onboarding because as you were doing your presentation i think we have some vocabulary um, and, and phrasing that we need to clean up but i think one of the artifacts we need to provide is standard job descriptions uh, that we can use so i'm going to take that as a note and then um, at the end we're going to ask for some volunteers to head some of this up but elper i i'm assuming you'd be willing to contribute to that yeah okay yeah, yeah. Exactly. So we're happy to share um, 
this material, I was actually before the call, I was trying to see if I could clean it up and make it a little bit less, uh, you know, just sort of like a little more standardized than just ad lib stuff. Um, so yeah, um, I'd be happy to do that. Do students communicate with researchers, faculty directly? Uh, do you, uh, and if you do, how do you check if their solution is the most optimal or at least correct? Um, so that's a, that's a good question. So um, when our senior graduate students have faculty consults uh, related to Quest um, or, or research, you know, researcher, they, they tend to have more you know, graduate students, maybe postdoc. Um, if a faculty asks for a computing or Quest related consult, Elper and I will still take those. But what they'll do is at the end of the consult in the ticket that triggered the consult happening, they'll write kind of like a summary response. They'll be like, dear so-and-so, it was great meeting with you yesterday. We talked about Jupyter Notebooks on Quest. Here's 8,000 links, just summary materials, yada, yada, yada. You know, and I see that then come through, you know, as I do all the other tickets. So that's a great way. Um, and actually what was nice is I didn't necessarily have to tell them to do that, they just, started doing it by themselves. <laughs> but anyways, it's uh, it is a great way um, to, to do that. All right, number six, do students have access to the user's project based data on the cluster? That is a great question. Um, we should have brought we should have mentioned that. So thank you so much for asking. Uh, our policy is we do not give uh, admin administrative privileges to our student consultant workers. Uh, in the infrastructure team gives some, uh, you know, need, their their tasks are a little bit more pseudo oriented in in their nature. So they do give them some heightened escalated privileges, the infrastructure team. Uh, but for the time being, the student consultant team does not. Um, it has so, its positives, it has its yeah. negatives, as you can imagine. <laughs> but just to say you can find ways to, um, work around that like some of those like they yes for to do everything they need those privileges but at the same time to do 90 percent of what you do or 85 percent they don't need it or there are some workarounds like giving some uh, partial elevated um, commands that they can use so they don't they don't really need to be pseudo pseudoers so so we we try to resolve that way instead of giving them full full permissions on the cluster but uh, yeah, we understand that different student groups do it um, um, differently. Uh, do you have a project charter or similar documentation that you could share? Uh, Elper, I'll leave that up to you since you probably maybe wrote that once upon a time. Um, by project charter, uh, do you mean any type of justification? I'm trying to. Yeah, I just couldn't. Uh, yeah. You Betsy, muted, Betsy, missing. sorry. Hey, the question came from Baru, if I'm saying the name correctly. Um, it, if you don't mind unmuting and maybe clarifying the question for us. Absolutely, yes. Um, uh, project Charter, I'm more envisioning this, um, uh, if we were to, to launch a program like that, probably will be a project based first. So we need some some sort of indeed justification to uh, to our higher ups. Uh, to justify certain programs, uh, the launch of certain projects, etc. So that's why I was asking whether you have some sort of similar document like a project charter that uh, that's a, you are used to, that, so then you, we can communicate these needs to our leadership. And that's a really great one. We've had that request. Again, Elper, I would put that as that's maybe one of those other artifacts we should provide. We call yeah. that an ROI, but um, I think each of us that have mature projects or programs that our institutions have some form of it, but we should probably consolidate that into one and provide that for the community. That's a really good one. Yeah. I don't know, Elper, if you have one on hand. I know we have one, yeah. but it's probably buried somewhere because Anita, do you have one on hand? But we should probably consolidate and make it available yeah. for everyone. That sounds like a good idea. I'll ask this last question and then um, thank you for all these great questions <laughs> from everybody. Uh, how many supervi uh, supervision hours on average per week for the data and computing support groups? Um, so for the computing team, um, 
we have 30 minute one on ones with the students. Uh, and so we have, you know, six, seven students right now. So that's um, about three, uh, three and a half hours. Um, and then we have one one hour weekly meeting um, that Elf and I try to both attend, but you know, sometimes it's just myself. Um, and then the real, so the supervision, fortunately, um, there's an uptick in that first month to two months upon a fresh hire um, because I think that burden is partially because of um, some of the peer mentoring things that we talked about where we're not quite 100% <laughs> With the peer mentoring, uh, if we had that better, it would be less. The I would say the bulk of the um, hour, like staff hours, really comes from um, doing the hiring. The the hiring can be very hour intensive. Um, you know, uh, looking at all the applications, doing the interviews, scheduling the interviews, all of that stuff um, can be quite intensive. Um, so so I don't need to, yeah. So Scott, I asked, I actually dropped a question as well. So how is your student program funded and where does the, it essentially where does the funding come from? Are you, and then we have a question from Tim, but where is your centrally funded or is it like, how do you come about your funding each year? Albert, you want to take that one? Yeah. So uh, basically majority of our funding is coming from the operation budget, IT's operation budget. So, uh, so I'm on, 21 positions, 17 of them are practically operational budgets. So we we do this, I think every like beginning of spring, we create a budget. It is for the for the next year. We submit it. Uh, so we either get something around last year or we had a small bump in the last couple of years. Uh, so the other three is coming from graduate assistantships, which is a great thing to have. So if I mean, I, I think this is something that um, other teams or other teams in the universities could discuss with their EGS, the graduate school, because that's a very popular position and it can be justified um, as a usual GA. And then we collaborate with some external programs, as, e, as I mentioned, year up. So if there are opportunities like that in the local area, so I recommend actually um, look, look for those opportunities because they could provide like excellent uh, people um, that, the, that you could actually both uh, benefit from and provide um, benefit to them as well. Okay, thank you. And Tim, it looks like you have a question. Yeah, just a clarification on the previous uh, answer. Um, about how many students could one FTE uh, manage to supervise? So if you were to have a hundred students, how many how many FTE do you think it take to supervise it? Sort of a more generalization of the previous. Answer. Yeah, that's a great that's a good question. Um, so Elper and I, I like I think I could manage if I pushed it five. I think I'm doing four of the seven right now. Yeah, that's that's even <laughs> I think pushing like because like there are things that we don't do right. We don't do like performance evaluations. There are things that we want to do but we cannot, right? So that's why I think I would say three. Three is the most effective along like everything that you're doing. You can probably do a good job with three with the meetings, regular meetings, supervising them through projects doing actually the performance analysis really as they um, throughout the years follow through. So yeah, after three or four, you really start yeah. keeping like losing people, uh, losing that track. So. so that's an interesting way to look at it as in having them as a, you know, kind of on the side students. So, you know, as you said, three or four, something similar to having graduate students as well. No, I was thinking as a, an entire program where you have, let's say a program manager for the students and that's all they did was look after students for hiring and mentoring and guiding and everything is associated with the student. Do you think that would be a viable approach? And if so, how, you know, how many students could, you know, let's say two or three FTE support? or how many FTE per student do you need, or students per FTE? Yeah, I, so, yeah, we haven't approached that way um, until now. So, I think so that's guys, a, Scott, you yeah. were saying. 
I think no, that's I a model we should investigate, though. Yeah, uh, no, exactly. I was just thinking the same thing. It's a really thought-provoking question, for sure. It's definitely not like, um, yeah, it's definitely not how we thought about. Sorry, okay. Jeff, to go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, we are a little running. We just have four minutes, and I really didn't get to the topic. I um, so. The next topic we had, and I, this is great conversation. I really appreciate everyone's discussion. But some of the things that came to light during this presentation is we really want to start standardizing on job descriptions and what does onboarding mean. So at the bottom of the call doc, you'll see some volunteers. We could really use some volunteers to help us start to standardize on these and maybe help so we can make them artifacts in the community. So one of the follow-ups for me and Anita is to maybe send out a more generalized list and get some folks, even if you don't currently have a student program, I feel like you can still contribute to this endeavor. I don't think you have to be have a mature program to add to add to it. And then the second one is Tim and Claire are on the call and they are doing a topic on mentoring and they're and we were hoping to collaborate with them since they focus on staff. We're focused on student and they have a team that's already being deployed to work on the student mentoring. And Tim and Claire, I don't know if you want to do give just a few minutes of what that might look like. Sure. Um, I've, um, what we've done is we've created a working group. And we have a couple people, Albert is one of them who, and so it's a natural fit that he would represent kind of both sides of that. But I think that in many cases, there is a blur between um, staff and student men mentoring as a, as a basic subject and then specifics for each staff and student. Um, but we're getting ready to kick that off. And um, so if some, if people are interested, they should put it in the, um, call doc or contact me directly and I'll send you the availability poll um, for our kickoff meeting because that's coming in. We want to have it in the next couple of weeks or so. And um, we want to look at examine. Um, um, are we talking about individual mentoring? Are we talking about developing a mentor program as a whole, a student mentor program, a staff mentor program, um, existing staff and staff who are moving up to the next level within RCD, um, staff who want to change careers and they want to move into RCD. Um, there's a lot of stuff to discuss and to figure out. The working group can figure out what exact de deliverables they want to work on um, to make it manageable. Um, really great conversation again today, and we are looking to increase our team um, to help deploy more of this out. And uh, the other shout out I will do is if you have a student program and would like to do a presentation, we would love to hear from you. And as you can see, it's not it's not painful to do. So uh, hopefully you would uh, maybe give that some thought. And uh, Anita and I will follow up with everyone on the call today, plus the additional onboarding, just or the additional list, the initial list we had to see if we can get some more framework around um, getting some job job descriptions, onboarding, and uh, the ROI one we talked about today, that project charter. I think those are three really great deliverables we'll focus on. Um, so with that, thank you for your time, and we'll see you next month for the staff CARC meeting. Thank you.